Good evening, and welcome to the second installment of Studio E, the Existential Series. My name is Susan Bond. I'm an actor and creative director for the Demitas Players, a local not-for-profit theater company. And I'm here to speak to you this evening on behalf of the playwright and the Demitas Players about what the stage represents to us. The stage for us is not just a platform to showcase our talents. For us, it is a classroom. We strongly believe that it's a classroom. If we are living the truth of our character, we can pull back the curtain and get a glimpse of the crooked timber of humanity. This will allow us to shine the spotlight on one of society's greatest pathos, mental illness. We as a troop are committed to shedding light on this illness and to giving voice to those who are afflicted with this disease. We are looking to initiate a conversation, an onstage conversation, to educate and enlighten, to bring focus to this specific cause. Through our craft, we will write, we will make music, we will sing, we will dance, we will promote our vision to address this important cause. We will use the talent to educate, to enlighten, and to bring focus to effect change. We want to create, to break silence. We want to cause a domino effect in the theater to again bring light on mental illness. The playwright's vision is to harness all the diverse talent within the group. We will be producing a number of plays, psychotronic films, and existential music composition to further this cause. I will be also integrating more with a leadership role for transition to a repertory company, which will enable us to produce more plays and have them evolve to the goal of bringing mental illness to light. I'd like to offer thanks and gratitude on behalf of the playwright Richard Cerulli, to James Kenny and the staff of the White Plains Community Media, and also Kymar Limited, as well as the Whippoorwill Theater in Armonk. If you would like more information and to see more of a comprehensive view of our body of work, we'd like you to visit our website at www.demitasplayers.com. Once again, we thank you for joining us this evening, and we hope to invite you back for Studio 3. Good evening and welcome. My name is Susan Bond. I'm an actor and creative director for the Demitas Troupe, a not-for-profit theater company. I've been asked to come here this evening and tell you what the stage represents to me. The stage for me and all actors is an opportunity to create. We take the words of the playwright and we craft them into a living being. We flesh out the emotional and physical attributes and we layer and create a rich history which includes relationships and political aspirations, uh, socioeconomic status, sexuality, and a host of other things. We breathe life into the lungs of our creation until it's self-sustaining. We want this entity to be able to stand and exist on its own. We are storytellers. We want you to laugh and cry. We want you to, to feel. We want you to empathize. We want you to come into our home, our living room, our, our bedroom. And we want you to share and experience feelings that touch your heart and your soul. If we can capture you for a few short minutes, this is what we want to achieve. To borrow the words of Sanford Meisner, an actor's job is to live truthfully under imaginary circumstances. If you can suspend your reality and believe in us, then we have accomplished our goal as actors. 
This is the first in our E-series, introducing you to existentialism in the theater. I took a test in existentialism and I left all the answers blank and I got a hundred. Woody Allen. Existentialism can be defined as a philosophy that emphasizes individual existence, freedom, and choice. It is the view that humans define their own meaning in life and try to make rational decisions in an irrational world. An artist is an existentialist and cerebral thinker, perceptive and spiritual by nature, and born with an awareness and sensitivity to their surrounding environment. Artists are the conscience of a society whose eyes see with all the beauty and the ugliness, whose ears hear the voices of the mighty and the downtrodden, whose hands touch the mud below and the raiments of kings, whose breath inhales the air of the free and the oppressed, and whose flesh feels both the lover's pain and pleasure. Artists take these feelings and sensations. They take them deep within their souls. They, they make us laugh and cry. They make us angry, distant. They bring us great joy. They make us feel alone at times and make us want to strike out in the name of justice or make us cry as we take etched memories to be painted on a canvas to write a new song to dance to to write a new play, to make us think, or, or to sculpt, all in the hope of sharing our observations as a social emotion for all to view. The art is not just about the artist. It is a reflection of the artist's environment. In essence, the artist's tools and perceptions are the mirror of our human condition and our social conscience. The words are written by playwright, author, and producer Richard Cerulli. We have Richard here today, and we're going to ask a few questions on the nature of existentialism, which his truth was founded on that premise. Richard has been an existentialist for quite some time now, and we want to get to the roots of what really influenced you and what caused you to think in this manner. So I'd like to ask you first if you could define existentialism, and I want to know what brought you to that way of thinking, that philosophy. Well, existentialism basically fills the vacuum that religion and traditional philosophy fail to address. Uh, when I say fail, what basically is occurring with religion and traditional philosophy is how to behave as a human being. And for the record, I'm an advocate for a traditional philosophy and religion, so I'm not making a criticism but they're basically steeped in how to be a good person. What existential basically does is to take a look at this and how do you navigate life, its absurdities, its trials, its tribulations, and how do you navigate it and you take your existence and turn it into an essence of life. And I think this is what people want to find in life. They want to find this happiness. And so existentialism is a way of people to look at themselves in a very honest sense. And, and I think this is what really drew me to the field because in life, uh, one of the things that existentialisms don't really like is isms, for one thing. And personally, I have a big disdain for cliches. Because if you've ever experienced a person going through a very difficult time or you see them um, not navigating life well, they'll always defer to a cliché. It's very shallow. It never really solves the problem. It's very superficial. Where existentialism says, let's take a really good look at this. I'm not happy in this state. Uh, I really can't prevent what's occurring. All I can do is react to it. And these are the tools I have. I have to take this existence and turn it into an essence. And, and that's what really drew me to existentialism and making it a part of all the play so people could take this life situation and watch a person going through this epiphany and they could look at that and say, that's either me or somebody I know. So uh, my goal has always been to take the stage and turn it as a venue for learning. So Richard, how has existentialism 
influence the way in which you perceive your characters, especially the pain your characters experience when they have their epiphany of truth? Well, I believe what, we, what I've always attempted to do, either in the books I write or the plays or the short stories, is to pick on a life situation and look at that from what goes in, what's really going on in that person's mind. Not just write from an external point of view and try to take that mind that's going through this very difficult period and walk the person through that particular mindset and try to put that person in situations that start influencing that, you know, their direction. And either two things will happen. They will either look at it and say, okay, I've made peace with this, that's fine, or I don't like what I see in myself and I need to get some therapy. I need to speak with someone. And that's what I'm going to need to transmute myself or reach to a higher self. So I really put that into the, uh, all my stories. And it's kind of a running joke with a lot of the truth is that, boy, all your books in it have such a terrible ending. And I said, but that's the point. Because what's really happening is it shows what happens when people don't insert themselves in a situation or take an existential view of themselves. This is what lies ahead of them. And this could be avoided if you just start taking a clear look at yourself. You know, separate yourself, you know, separate yourself from pop culture, the cliches, and, and strip yourself of your own baggage of what really makes you happy, you know? So do we, I want to follow the herd and be heavily mortgaged and do all these things and work at a job I hate? Or do I want to discard this, quote, image I'm trying to create on myself? Once again, it's a talisman, you know, you're creating it for yourself. And do I want to set myself free? And what do I want in life? And, and that's where those existential epiphanies occur. And that person has to make that choice. But when they make it, they should find peace with it and reach, quote, that essence. Because if they haven't reached the essence, they're just existing. So Richard, in many of your works, the characters take the position of not following the crowd or an anti-hive mentality. Why is this so? Well, what I like to do with the main character is when they are introduced either in the book or the play, they're going through some type of painful event. And they're speaking. Sometimes it's if it's a play, it will be through dialogue. If it's a book, it's what's going through their head. And what will happen is the viewer may initially think that this is the end.